David Brockman is a retired fire captain with Cal Fire. He lives in Gridley, California, a rural community an hour north of Sacramento. About three years ago, a friend of his asked him to dispose of some fireworks. David agreed to help. They didn't want to throw it in the trash can because, you know, it goes to the dump and somebody runs over it and, then, you know. So I decided to light it instead of soaking it in a tub of uh, soapy water and dissolving it and tearing it apart. But it, instead of it doing what it was supposed to do, it detonated in my hand. It was, it was bad choice and bad luck cross paths. He was flown to UC Davis Health in Sacramento, where surgeons determined they couldn't save his hand. They amputated from the wrist down. David then had a choice learn to live without his hand, or learn to use a prosthesis or artificial hand. He chose the latter. Because I was right-handed and I lost my right hand. So I had to relearn how to use my prosthetic as my right hand, as well as learn how to do things left-handed where I needed more than just the hook. Because that's all I have right now is just the prosthetic hook. His prosthesis is a simple mechanical hook and harness device that's been on the market for several decades. A harness around his shoulders keeps a carbon fiber prosthetic sleeve attached to his forearm. On the end of that is a steel hook, and the hook has two fingers to it that open and close by me physically moving a cable that is attached to it. And by me manipulating either my, my arm by pushing out or manipulating my left shoulder, it pulls on a cable which opens and closes the hook. David also has another prosthetic device, a high-tech one called a myoelectric. It works by using electrical signals from the muscles in his forearm. I have that one, and I think I've only worn it like twice or three times, because one, it's uncomfortable, and two, it's not functionally, it doesn't function well, it's more aesthetics. It looks nice, it'll open and close, but, and I, I'm not wearing a harness, it just sets on my arm. But to do what I am, very physical, and be outside working in the yard, raking, doing things like that, it doesn't work. David is trying a new myoelectric prosthesis that he hopes will work better. He hasn't given up wearing one, but many amputees do, despite the improved technology. One recent study found that 44% of arm amputees reject or abandon their device entirely. UC Davis surgeons and engineers are collaborating to solve this problem, in this episode of Unfold, we look at how the combination of surgery and machine learning is making life easier for amputees. Coming to you from UC Davis and UC Davis Health, this is Unfold, a podcast that breaks down complicated problems and unfolds curiosity-driven research. I'm Amy Quinton. And I'm Marianne Ross Sharp. Not too long ago, the standard surgery for an amputee could still leave patients in a lot of pain. Hand and plastic surgeon Andrew Lee with UC Davis Health says that's because surgeons would have to cut bone, muscle, and nerves to remove a limb. Usually nerves were either buried in muscle or buried in soft tissue. Sometimes they would bury it in bone uh, to allow the nerves not to grow towards the surface of the skin and create a sensitive nerve end. Unfortunately, even burying those nerve endings doesn't help some amputees. Many patients still develop what are called neuromas. It's like a live wire. You can end up having the nerves grow uh, and form a scar ball at the kind of that interface where it's buried. Uh, I have heard of cases where the muscle itself became um, extremely sensitive, where moving that muscle um, created kind of electrical sensations and discomfort. And you've probably heard of phantom pain. That's when an amputee can feel cramps or burning where the amputated limb used to be. As many as two million amputees in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain. Some have to rely on medications, including opioids. And as you might imagine, the pain from neuromas can also make wearing a prosthetic device impossible. And even amputees that don't experience pain can sometimes have difficulty wearing a prosthesis because they're difficult to operate. I talked to Ladon Smedley about this. He's a certified prosthetist orthotist at UC Davis Health. Meaning he fits amputees with new artificial limbs. Right. And he's also a biomedical engineer. He says the more high-tech devices, the myoelectric ones, aren't exactly easy to use. For a hand amputee, Smedley says some work by attaching two electrodes to the forearm, and amputees would have to use those forearm muscles to move the hand in different ways. 
and they would have to memorize kind of these patterns of flexion and extension or co-contraction to operate the hand. So I describe it somewhat like Morse code to where you have to memorize these sequences to do different uh, gestures with the hand. That does not sound intuitive. No, it's not. And Jonathan Schofield agreed. He's an assistant professor in the mechanical and aerospace engineering department at UC Davis who is researching this problem. Right now, even though there's amazing dexterous devices that can move in all sorts of ways and look similar and operate similar to an intact limb, being able to tell all of that robotic system how to move and, and what you want it to do is, is really where a big barrier is currently in the field. Schofield says some of the newer myoelectric devices are so complex, they require amputees to use smartphones to select the grasp they want to use. So they have to use an app? Yeah. He says that's not exactly intuitive either. When I think about opening and closing my intact hand, I'm not pulling out my iPhone to do that or trying to pulse and contract and you know isolate specific muscle groups to open and close my hands to make a pinching motion. How far away are we from being able to improve these systems? Not very far, actually. We'll get into that in a bit. It's important to note, though, that surgeons really help pave the way to make myoelectric devices easier to use. That's right. Surgeons, not engineers. Yeah. Several years ago, surgeons began operating on amputees using a procedure called targeted muscle re or TMR. The surgery reroutes amputated nerves to other nerves in residual muscles. This is instead of burying the nerve ending in muscle or bone. UC Davis plastic surgeon Clifford Pereira says by doing this, called re they are restoring function to that muscle. Signals from the brain that once controlled the now missing hand are now able to control the new muscles. These new muscles are smart enough to do what the old muscles used to. We can then convert the dumb muscle into a smarter muscle because based on what the patient thought of, say, making a fist or opening their fingers or bending their, bending their wrist or bending their elbow, different parts of the muscle will contract. And using that, the prosthetic could be a little bit more intuitive. Ultimately then, amputees don't have to learn how to control the device using muscles they wouldn't normally use for that action. They don't have to learn a complicated sort of Morse code technique. Right. That's very cool. What's cooler is the secondary effects of this procedure, says hand surgeon Andrew Lee. It was originally done to increase the number of muscle signals that a patient could generate after an amputation. So they, there could be more degrees of control of a prosthetic device. Um, and a kind of an unintended benefit was that those patients also tended to have reduced phantom limb pain and neuroma pain as well. So reduced pain was just completely by accident? Yeah, although it kind of makes sense giving a cut nerve ending something to do. Right. The procedure should be great for lowering the number of amputees who need medication to relieve pain then. Yeah, exactly. Also, I read that if surgeons can transfer multiple nerves, amputees can have even more mobility, more fluid motion, and simultaneous control of joints. One amputee who had the surgery is David Brockman. He's the one who's still using his hook and harness device. Yeah, when I interviewed him the first time he was. So I caught up with him again as he was getting fitted for a brand new prosthesis, a smarter prosthesis. Today we have your uh, prosthetic hand that's attached to the clear socket. We have the electrodes built into it. Okay. Um, Ladon Smedley so and Ferran Mayer, both UC Davis health prosthetists, no, okay. are about to fit David Brockman with a new myoelectric device. They're using a long sleeve that's made out of a crinkly parachute material to help slide David's forearm into the clear plastic socket of his prosthesis. Oh, this, so this is just like putting a stocking on to help it slide in? This is yep. one of those wind vane sliding things, yeah. Gotcha. It's going to help get your tissue in there. They need the fit to be tight so it doesn't fall off, but not so tight that it pinches. Now that your elbow's in there, is this still biting you? Yeah, there? right there. You can see you can see the white mm -hmm. spot right there. Yeah. What about the elbow back there? The elbow, I can feel it. It, it, it's, it would be uncomfortable if I wore it all day. Mm -hmm. Right now, it doesn't hurt, but I can definitely feel it. After Mayer makes some adjustments, Smedley brings out a robotic hand to attach to the socket. It looks like a black glove, and the fingers can move independently, just like the hand in the movie The Terminator. Smedley uses an app to test out the movement first. So I'm doing this from the app. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> 
All the fingers wiggling. David says this new myoelectric device was considered experimental when he first got his hand amputated, so his insurance company wouldn't pay for it. He's excited that that's now changed. They actually call it a bionic hand. It's a working functional hand. It has five fingers. Um, It's got like 13 sensors built into the sleeve, and it works off of muscle reactions in my arm. And so when I twitch my thumb nerve, uh, which is still there, the, the prosthetic senses that and the thumb will move. But first, Mayer says the prosthesis has to learn how to read these signals. We're going to train the system to understand the patterns that he's firing with his muscles inside. Before it was like you had to extend or flex to cause certain open-close reactions to happen. Now what we're trying to do is read everything and ask the computer to kind of sort out Does that look like an open signal or does that look like a closed signal? David says the new prosthetic device will make a huge difference in his life. They said with practice, I'll be able to pick up like coins off the ground again, uh, things like that. For me, uh, I love the outdoors. This is a dream come true because I'll actually be able to grab my fishing pole and and reel and grab things again instead of trying to hook it and, and it keeps slipping off. Amy, it sounds like the combination of surgery and these smarter prosthetic devices will be life-changing for some amputees. That's the goal, but as you might imagine, there are still a lot of things these prosthetic devices can't do well, or can't do at all. Like what? Well, there are still issues with speed, lag time, and movements that aren't very smooth. Even David's new prosthesis requires an app so he can select a grasp, although he can use several simultaneously. I guess you can't feel through a prosthetic hand either. So you probably can't tell if something's hot or cold or what about like pressure? Yeah, Smedley mentioned that this was an issue with one of his arm amputees that has a young daughter. He wants to know that when he's holding his child's hand that he's not gonna squeeze it. You know, imagine one of his young daughters, you know, already seeing his dad kind of wearing this prosthetic arm and maybe being a little weirded out by it. And then it just, you know, squeezes her hand too hard. It would be um, somewhat traumatizing for us. So that's always a concern of his. Our surgeons, engineers, and neurobiologists are collaborating to address these issues. The ultimate goal is the concept of prosthetic embodiment. I imagine that means they want these devices to really mimic a biological limb. Yeah, and to do so without the increased complexity. UC Davis neuroscientist Wilson Joyner is part of this collaboration and studies how humans learn and control movement. So there's certain properties that we know about motor control, and a lot of those properties are not reflected in your ability to control prosthetics. And right there, that's a problem, because if, you, if you're not utilizing what some natural abilities, or at least the um, natural infrastructure of our motor system to basically control an external device like that, it's, it's probably going to be inc- incredibly difficult and non-intuitive to learn how to do. So he and engineer Jonathan Schofield are trying to make these devices feel and operate much more naturally. And that's what we're trying to fill that gap, is we're trying to say, how can we allow someone to think about making a pinching motion or think about making a fist with their missing hand and just let the prosthetic limb do that for them? So where do they start? They're first examining muscle firing patterns of amputees who have had TMR surgery, including David Brockman. One way of doing that is through electromyography, which records the muscle's electrical activity. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to, to think about closing and opening your hand. We're starting trail now. This is inside a UC Davis lab where the research is taking place. And Pinch. Schofield has attached electrodes to David Brockman's forearm. Pinch. Relax. We were measuring the muscle activity in Pinch. that limb, and we were asking him to think about Relax. moving his missing hand into various positions, so pinches, fists, moving his wrists up and down and rotating his wrists. Pinch, relax. They would tell me, point your finger, even though I don't have a finger anymore, point your finger. And their machine would read that muscle movement or that muscle thought. Relax. What we were trying to figure out is, um, can we recognize patterns in his muscle activity when he tries to do those things with his missing hand. Marianne, electromyography is one way to examine how David's muscles are firing, 
But sometimes it doesn't give you the full picture. Sometimes it picks up electrical signals from other muscles. So scientists are also using ultrasound to detect those signals as well. Right, ultrasound uses sound waves to produce images. Yeah, and if you contract your muscle, it becomes denser, so it bounces back more sound. This also allows scientists to see even deeper muscles. And they're taking that data set and using machine learning. So we're leveraging um, artificial intelligence machine learning um, algorithms that are looking at the muscles that remain in that person's residual limb. And it's looking at that activity and it's learning what that activity looks like when they want to pinch or make a fist or make a pointing motion. So they're making a prosthesis way more intuitive by using both ultrasound and electromyography. And AI. Now that's cool. One of the other problems you mentioned was that amputees still can't feel their prosthetic devices. So they have no way to gauge temperature or even pressure. Uh, Is there a way to address that problem? Yeah, let's take temperature, for example. It's important. You're going to want to feel a handshake or feel touch. You're also going to want to know if your prosthetic hand is on fire, right? Right. The problem is sensory nerves are also cut during amputation. But surgeon Clifford Pereira says surgeons may be able to do with sensory nerves what they did with motor nerves in the targeted muscle reinnervation. The way we are trying to do that is through something called TSR, or targeted sensory reinnervation. So the idea is you take the same cut nerves, or the amputated nerves, and take the sensory fibers and connect them to sensory nerves in the overlying skin. Then, if the artificial hand is touched or gets hot, it would send that signal to the skin of the amputee. That is very cool, or very hot, (laughs) as as the case may be. It sounds like what they're doing is really integrating prosthetic devices into the body, almost like a human machine. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned integration. So let me ask you, if you close your eyes and wave your hand, do you know where your hand is and how fast it's moving? Okay, let me try. (laughs) Yes, definitely. Your brain can't perceive that action with a prosthetic device, unless, of course, you literally integrate it into your limb or body, which is the next step in smart prosthetics. Wait, what? It's called osseointegration. Here's the way surgeon Andrew Lee described it. Which is making the prosthetic essentially heal into the bone and become a weight-bearing structure. Uh, Bionic? A bionic arm. Marianne, this sounded to me just like something really futuristic. Or like something from the Bionic Man, right? You mean the 1970s show, The Six Million Dollar Man? Steve Austin will be that man. Better than he was before. Better. Better, Stronger. stronger, Faster. faster. Yep. (laughs) Okay, but you are kidding, right? Because this doesn't give amputees super strength. We're not really creating bionic people. No, of course not. Lee went on to explain this better before I jumped to ridiculous conclusions. With osseointegration, you can still take it off, but it's much more uh, a solid component of your body that could potentially make things a lot more intuitive, a lot more natural, if you will. Um, Like picking up heavy things, doing pull-ups potentially. Osseo-integrated implants for lower extremities are FDA approved and allow direct integration between bone and the surface of a prosthetic device. So it feels a lot like part of your body. Exactly. We've unpacked a lot in this episode, but you can find even more on our website, including video of some of these prosthetic devices. Yeah, and you can watch David Brockman's new myoelectric prosthetic hand and check out all of our episodes at ucdavis.edu slash unfold. I'm Amy Quinton. And I'm Marianne Rush-Sharp. Unfold is a production of UC Davis. Original music for Unfold comes from Damien Verrett and Curtis Jerome Haynes. Additional music comes from Blue Dot Sessions. Did you know you can listen to Unfold on YouTube? Just search for Unfold, a UC Davis podcast, and you can find all of our episodes from this season and previous seasons. What better way to listen to a podcast than to watch it? 
If you like this podcast, check out UC Davis's other podcast, The Backdrop. It's a monthly interview program featuring conversations with UC Davis scholars and researchers working in the social sciences, humanities, arts, and culture. Hosted by public radio veteran Soterius Johnson, the conversations feature new work and expertise on a trending topic in the news. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.